Got it. Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really great being here. Yes. And I've been I've been collaborating with Session Lab for such a long time. And you needed to to release a report on the state of facilitation um, for me to invite you to the podcast. What a shame. <laughs> I, I think that's fine. I think uh, as long as we are helpful in the background, we don't need the spotlight. Yes, very humble of you to say <laughs> that. And let me start with the same question that I ask every guest on the show. Do you start, well, <laughs> would you call yourself a facilitator? And if so, since when? That's a very interesting question for me because I I started Session Lab and, and this whole journey um, because I would say now I'm a facilitator and I was a facilitator. Uh, but when I did that, I did not know that I am and I was. Um, so I would say my background in this area comes from training. I was doing a training in an NGO um, and that's where we started thinking since we were also I have a technical background and a lot of my colleagues uh, back then had a technical background. So we were constantly thinking, okay, how can we make this process of training others in soft skills better supported with technology? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had many ideas. One, one of them was something that uh, later turned on to be Session Lab. And at that time, I think, you know, we talked about facilitation as, as part of what you need to be good at as a trainer but i don't think i consider that as a label you would you would put on on somebody it was only much later even after we started session lab um, actually the product was not called session lab in in the first couple of years it was called trained on um, and uh, only when we started getting more clients more users did we understood that facilitation is the keyword here and uh, that trainers are as well facilitators, but there are also many, many other types of facilitation and facilitators around. Um, so yeah, I guess at that point I realized, okay, I, I was facilitator all that time as well. And, and I guess I am now, but uh, I don't know exactly when was that switch that, that happened. Uh, what that a journey. Realized this, yeah. When was the switch then for Session Lab? And maybe for the audience who doesn't know Session Lab, yeah. it's um, an online agenda planning organizing tool. So I maybe you want to explain actually what it is, but I'm such I, a big fan. I, I'm curious first to hear how you would how you would explain it, and I can add if I have any. So for to add. me, the best way to explain it is maybe by explaining what the pain is without using it. So I'm seeing so many facilitators um, designing their workshop plan in Excel. So every row would be a certain activity and then they have the time in the first column. And mm -hmm. then they realize, oh, actually we need to change the order. So they have to recalculate all the times or and they have to do all the calculation, whether the time adds up to however long their session needs to be. And that's a nightmare. And Session Lab basically has all of this built in so that you can drag and drop your activities. There's a library of activities that you can use. You can choose your own ones. And it adds up all the minutes of all the activities and gives you the length of your session at the end. And you can add comments and links and everything yes. and even have a color code. So I have a color code, whether something is a solo activity or large group activity or small group activity, or whether it's um, kind of input. And then I see whether my session is nicely balanced. Exactly. I think, I think you'd well described the the features and the value that that comes uh and and ex actually the inspiration uh for the session lab uh was solving this problem of having excel uh agendas all over and and not being able to collaborate on them as well uh and adjusting them in real time or when you're preparing uh it was a mess uh, and i think um 
now we we went beyond just this problem of of adjusting timing um because uh, in this post covid world world where there is a lot of online um i think collaborating uh, through a digital platform to be able to uh, better plan and deliver workshops i think became quite important and uh, yeah i think uh, to summarize it it's it's a collaborative platform for workshop design and delivery true that's an aspect that i totally forgot so yeah. i'm working with a group of 15 facilitators maybe more on a client project mm -hmm. and we all access the same agenda and can leave our comments after each session so that we can constantly improve it yes and as I mentioned in the intro, you just released the first um, state of facilitation report where I think you collected inputs from over a thousand facilitators from across the exactly. globe exactly. about facilitation. Yeah. And before we are getting into the results, I would be curious what got you to do that because you just explained that initially your product wasn't for facilitators or you didn't know that it was for facilitators and now suddenly it's this you become the spokes organization about the state of facilitation yeah what made oh. the difference what was the journey mm -hmm. um yeah that's that's a very good question um i think the way of us becoming, as you said, it spoke spoke uh, people for the facilitators um, is is a longer way. I mean, we started. Um, okay, I think I think this at this moment I will <laughs> restart the question, um, the answer. Um, so yeah, this was a good question. Um, I think the shift from us realizing that we are focusing on facilitators uh not now is already quite back it it, uh, it was i think six years ago that that we uh changed the name and um focused uh more on facilitation uh, not only on training as we started um and i think um very quickly we realized uh, there is not a lot at that time so i'm talking six years ago there is not a lot um, talk about facilitation online in any way um so we uh, very quickly started blogging a lot about it um trying to um, use our own experience and um sometimes collaborating with our uh, with our clients to uh, figure out what are what are the needs and what areas can we cover uh, both um in terms of expanding the knowledge about facilitation and and giving tips and um and just sharing um but that was in a way um one-sided it was it was our opinion or opinion of maybe a few other people or research that we could do on certain topic um but i think the idea of wanting to do something like this report was around for for several years actually because uh, we always wondered uh how are other people actually doing this thing uh, how are other people um facilitating uh solving problems which tools they are using um and all of these questions that that we asked and there are many questions we didn't ask uh, just because we needed to make it reasonable length um all of those, these things were were something that we had a hunch about uh but wanted to wanted to quantify a bit more and and get uh conversation started because as we saw uh, from the report, there are many things that are not prescribed in this very dynamic, very diverse field. Um, and I think they open more questions than than they give answers um, into the way of doing facilitation. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more? What does it mean? So I think um, I, uh, having a technical background, I always uh, draw parallel and and to some extent this report uh was inspired by a lot of other reports i see in the tech community um and similarly there when you say like 
a developer, um, similar to how we say a facilitator, it doesn't say much. It it it. Yeah, you are facilitating a process. You're 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 getting somebody from point A to point B. You're probably working with people in a room or in a, in, in online setting and, and something and and using certain basic um, processes. But then everything else is so diverse. Uh, actual tools you use, um, actual methods, um, formats of your session. Uh, all of those things uh, are are so varied that I think. Uh, it would be challenging to say, okay, uh, read this one book or take this one course, and then you are you are a facilitator. You're done. <laughs> um, and I think this is uh, this is what report uh, showed us as well. Uh, in a lot of place uh, places, other was the most <laughs> most common answer. Uh, there was no one prescribed uh, or one best uh, answer for the tool or method or any of those things. So I think um, in that way, if anybody comes to the report in, in hope of finding the best way to do something, they will not get that there. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, anybody who is entering facilitation is probably aware of, of diversity already and uh, will be inspired by all the other, all the options that might they might discover in the report rather than finding one solution. Mm. one approach so what was the biggest surprise in the report or the what is the overall story of the report um in a nutshell um so the over, overall story since this is the first one we um we basically had questions uh like who who are facilitators what are they doing and how do they do it and what challenges they have. Um, so um, if we reflect on those uh, questions, the, the story is uh, facilitators are spread around. Uh, they are everywhere. Uh, they are um, coming from various backgrounds. Um, they are uh, what we call uh, or, or, or challenge are like they might be lonely uh, mm -hmm. in a way. I think that was one of the uh, threads we saw in several questions. And and even after the report came out and all the feedback we got uh, on it, some were actually challenging this uh, this aspect, which is something we loved because we are not claiming this is uh, this is how it is. It's just mm -hmm. it's just a perspective we've managed to get with our limited uh reach and and um yeah so uh but this lonely facilitator is an interesting concept because um what we see is often facilitation happens uh by one person mm -hmm. um it's it, it's more dominant than having co-facilitators um so uh and often facilitators are independent facilitators they're not part of organizations at least the ones we reached again uh, yeah. we did have more than thousand but that's a fraction uh, or a drop in the pond of all the facilitators in the world so uh, at least in our report uh, we we got this sense that there is a lot of uh, a lot of individuals who do this by themselves and have have their own clients and so on um but the the uh let's say challenge to that we we got in, in feedback after the report was that actually um while those things are true facilitators don't necessarily feel lonely because of this constant interaction with participants mm. with clients with um, the community the ones that are part of the community so that there is actually never really a, a sense of loneliness uh, but rather of of immense richness and i can draw this par parallel to um to teachers um mm. I've, I've i've been um at the university and, and at some point maybe even considered having a, a academic career and um there i really enjoyed and i, I to, to some extent now i, I think oh, I, obviously i was having a facilitator role there as well, but I immensely enjoyed being in front of these students and every year get, getting new batch of students uh, that bring new experiences 
to me as well. So it's not only me giving uh, knowledge and and um, education to them, but it's also them bringing their own perspectives and and experiences which enriched me. So um, yeah, I think there is uh, the the lonely facilitators is more in in ways of operation rather than um, than feeling of loneliness. And it's it's interesting that you got this challenging feedback because. From what I heard, and I started the Never Done Before community for facilitators with something similar in mind that, yes, we are constantly with groups and we're creating this safe space and collaborative spirit for others, but we're always outside. Mm -hmm. And I think it at some point does feel lonely in the sense that a who is creating the space for us? When are we getting to participate and actually play a little bit? And also, where can we get feedback and input or maybe even an opportunity to test our own work before walking in front of a group? Yeah. And I think this makes it lonely. And Absolutely. Having also worked in academia before, yes, we are constantly with students and with other colleagues but at the end of the day you're sitting there and planning your lecture yourself you're sitting there and writing your paper alone yeah yeah and yeah yeah and i think uh that connects to the the second learning out of i don't know seven eight we 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 had overall the report and and that's the community aspect where we saw um i think it was more than a quarter of participants not being part of any community um which is a big number in in my opinion because i think um since facilitation is um such a new thing and and there is no uh like there are no um strong established ways of of educating yourself in a facilitation communities are at the moment i think the best the best choice you have to to become a better facilitator um you can read the books you can um you can learn uh, from online resources that exist to some extent but then practice is one way and and the other way is is observing others and and both of those you can do through communities a lot of communities i'm aware of do have ways of you to come to the community and practice a new method or a new approach or get feedback on it and and observe how others are doing things um so yeah i think uh, i think there is a lot of work to be done there yet yeah 100 percent. and it's beautiful to observe how many new communities are actually um emerging and i would love to hear from your community as well um, because I know that Session Lab, you also have started yes. a community yeah. also with sessions, um, with community members hosting sessions. Yeah. Before getting there, though, I would like to come back to something else that you mentioned is the co-facilitator. And I was actually quite surprised how how small the number was of facilitators who stated to work with a co-facilitator. Yeah. And I was wondering where this is coming from. Did you? Get I, it? Yeah, I I don't think I can answer that question. Um, we we didn't have a question that could explain that um, follow up question uh, related to to that question. So I I can only uh, guess, and um, also through through talking uh, with. with other people like yourself who who contributed to the report and helped analyze the results. I think the the leading thought is it's about costs because mm -hmm. two facilitators you really cost more than one, and yeah. of of ten organizations already have hard time uh, pricing facilitation because often they see the eight hours or four hours or whatever hours you you stand in front of the audience and 
everything else is is a challenge for facilitators to to price in all the work that needs to go to actually make this proper and bespoke and and whatnot so then on top of that like but why do i need two of you if if you are mm-hmm. good enough to to deliver it uh, so i think um i think that that i would uh, i would buy that explanation yeah, yeah. yes definitely this could be one and I wonder whether whether with facilitators, and this might be provocative, maybe some in the audience would laugh um, <laughs> or get angry. Um, we have this with teachers as well, but I think teachers are very bad in collaboration because they're so, and academics in general, we're so used to just define our own workflow and we know better. In German, there's a joke um, that says, God knows everything and teachers know everything better. (laughs) And I somehow wonder, and I wouldn't exclude myself, whether for facilitators it's often the same. So if I have an idea of how the session should be, it's, it's great to have input from others and to get a challenge. But at the end, when it comes to the final design, it's just faster doing it alone. And with a co-facilitator who's not, if you're not in sync, you need this kind of dance with a partner where you can throw the ball to each other. And that is not self-evident, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there is definitely something in that. And and I immediately jumped back. Uh, in a reflective way uh, to moments in which I was co-facilitating and my partner was on the stage and I was in the in the background waiting for my turn and they would say something and I would think like oh but I would say this differently and then you miss this opportunity to connect <laughs> to that other point um, so so I think there is there is a bit of that in that for sure um, and I think also maybe more so in facilitation where you sort of need to build up your ego to actually be even able to stand in front of people and, and, mm-hmm. and talk and, and lead them. So I think uh, that maybe conflicts a bit uh, with, with collaboration. Um, but at the same time, or not at the same time, but another thing that, that um, came to my mind from what you were saying, it might be that people have not... Uh, not experience co-facilitation mm-hmm. at all and and don't even think that that's you know a thing that has any benefit or or um maybe that doesn't even cross their mind because um i think one thing that also comes out from the re- report is that uh a lot of people don't come to facilitation as okay, I want to be a facilitator, tell me how to do it. And I think that's part, partially probably uh, why you have that first question at, here at the podcast, uh, because mm. uh, there is always an interesting story and not I just went to, to college and I became a facilitator yeah. behind it. Um, so if you are, um, I don't know, service designer and, and you're doing participatory workshops and and, you know, you might have not considered that, that you can do that with somebody else and that you can split this responsibility and and yeah so i think good point that's maybe something to bring back to communities to um cuz often also what i see in in communities is okay um i'm i have this method i want to try i'm i'm going to bring it and then other facilitators come and and feedback but what if we challenge them and say like okay sure who else from the community will co-facilitate with you let's let's do it like that let's try um to sort of challenge people to to co-facilitate with people that they have not done that before Um, and it's it's actually funny that you're saying that because for the for the festival for the never done before mm -hmm. festival we air quotes force our community members to pair up Mm -hmm. So nobody is allowed to host a workshop alone. That's awesome. And initially they were like, oh, but I I have this idea. I want to do it alone. But what it does, it, A, it brings the community closer together. 
Yeah. And everyone really learns something. And I think especially when it comes to creative workshops, two brains do think better than one. Mm -hmm. And it is a great way to just test whether whether we match with another co-facilitator. Yeah. Because I think then standing in front of a client is something totally different, as you said, especially when it comes to training and there are different ways of explaining things. You really have to be in sync and I think be able to, to actually drop the ego on the one hand to say, to invite the other, do you have something to add? Um, but also to to acknowledge that there is no perfect way to maybe explain or introduce it and it will just be fine. Yeah. And finally, have you, have you received yeah. any, um, any negative or n less favorable feedback to, to that approach after the, uh, festival? Mm, uh, no. And I think it's, it's biased because those who end up facilitating together are those for whom it worked. Mm -hmm. So we did have some dropouts along okay. the way. Yeah. Yeah. If it just, sometimes you realize that it doesn't work and then mm. you might give up. And then I think co-facilitation online is also different than co-facilitation um, on site. Absolutely. Where I recently, so I almost don't do co facilit no, I don't do on-site facilitation anymore. Mm. I had the opportunity when I was in Australia recently to um, to support two colleagues, Michelle and Reese, and we had such compliments in the space because we had different energies, different perspectives, and the way how we worked the room together was just amazing. Mm. But well, it was a group of. 250 people as well. So we needed some more eyes and arms. Yeah. yeah. What I just thought was in the back end, are you, you are probably able to look at the session. Um, no, you might be able to retrieve information whether most of the sessions are shared with someone or just owned by by facilitator alone yeah yeah we could do that um obviously if we would do anything like this we would do it in a way of not compromising any uh, privacy or or yeah, uh, yeah, anything yeah. like that um but i think immediately this would not really paint a good picture because um Sometimes people have a shared account that they use. Uh, everybody logs in with the same account. Um, or they share the session with um, visitors, and then we don't know how to exactly uh, differentiate who is a co-facilitator and who is a, uh, just a visitor as a participant or client or or anything like this. Wow. So uh -huh. I think there is there is a there are challenges there. Good point. Yeah. It would be interesting though to if it if it was possible to cross check the the information about the co-facilitator. Yeah. How yeah. many people work on a session design? It would be. And I, I, I think we could um we could do something because you can assign um specific blocks to people. So if you're using um all the features or, or, or more of the features of Session Lab, then you might be doing that. You were, okay, I have two facilitators and you're doing this block, I'm doing this block and, and so on. Um, so that we could do. We could see how many sessions uh, have more than one person assigned to a block. But again, I didn't uh, even know that. yeah, <laughs> that's why I said if there are many <laughs> things, uh, there are many things we, we see very expert facilitators not finding, which is, our motivation to improve uh, in the next year. I think um, we've built this product uh, over the good part of 10 years and some things are as they looked 10 years ago. And so it's <laughs> a bit of a time for an update. Yeah, although it's there were many updates already in the recent month. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The, the start of it only. And um, there was another thing that I found interesting um in what you mentioned was that who is you mentioned service designers 
And I think there are many, especially in the in the corporate world, people who do facilitate even as their main activity, but who wouldn't necessarily call themselves facilitators. And I'm thinking of scrum masters and agile coaches and service designers. Yeah. Were these also part of the report where they reflected in it? Or do you think that they are somewhere apart? So I think they are definitely part of the report because if we do look at um how do you call this like sector or no not sector but uh i can quickly look it up uh it's too many things to find uh profession yeah if we look at the profession we can definitely see um that there are people quite some people that um identify as designers 18 percent and some type of managers, agile practitioners, 13% and so on. So I think um, there is uh, definitely those people that are in the report. The question is, is the number representative? And I don't think it is mm -hmm. because I think the ones that are in the report are the ones that we manage to reach, which majority are within our network. So they are the ones that have discovered Session Lab or uh, well, yeah, Session Lab as a tool or Session Lab as, as a resource because we have the library, we have the newsletter, so we have other resources as, as contact points. And um, however, I think many, many more have not because they don't really look for facilitation related uh, content and uh, tools mm -hmm. because they are not aware, as you said, that, that they are actually doing that. So I think one of the challenges for for next years uh, and, and next reports is to to expand on all of those areas we missed, um, and and try to get those people more. Uh, when promoting this report, I was actually uh, sharing in all the communities that I was part of um, that are not facilitation communities. I'm part of design communities. Yeah. I'm part of um, some leadership communities, and I was I was sharing everywhere where I truly believe that there is a significant amount of people that that would and should identify um as as facilitators yeah. but in general this kind of share, sharing in, in communities did not bring a lot of people uh, to to answer uh, 20 minute long surveys yeah so yeah true it's always uh if you're if you really identify as a facilitator and you're curious about the answers then you would invest the time yeah. it just made me aware of that there are actually two two groups of facilitators that are doing very different work so for instance when i think of scrum masters agile coaches um sorry Scrum masters, agile coaches, um, design thinkers, service designers, mm -hmm. who they follow a very clear method. So they are following a structure that is yeah. predefined. So most probably they don't redesign their sessions regularly because they apply the same thing. And mm -hmm. then facilitation rather means managing group dynamics getting the the shy voices to speak and these yeah. kind of things yeah whereas other facilitators um, who are more into strategy or team building or ideation solution finding they are looking into the activities and they might redesign the session from scratch each time yes yes and and this is sort of also the realization we had when we when we rebranded basically just changed the name because uh, trainers are often in the first category of of uh, people that um, don't change so much their process because this is the training and this is what you know usually the industry or whoever wants so uh, there is not much need for for adopting because that's what you're selling. You're selling a training, a, a curriculum, let's say. 
um, while uh, facilitators are the ones that do more bespoke content and, and then there is more this interaction around the design. But that all be, being said, um, for a long time, one of our bigger customers, maybe not even the biggest, was a, a Scrum uh, team. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think uh, if done well, even even prescribed processes can uh, both benefit from uh, from a tool like Session Lab, where where it helps you guide you through the process as well. Because it gives you the timing, it gives you uh, things uh, that you can um, interact with. Because when you're delivering, even if you have a prescribed process, you might not stay on time, and you might uh, you might need to adjust. Um, as well as probably evolve. Uh, prescribed process just tells you more or less what are the rituals. But as your team and needs and experience grows, you you're changing the the minor detail details of that process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. And you can put in links and all the kind of notes of what you're actually delivering within these blocks. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the, are you a facilitator or are you facilitating? And I think for then the trainers, the scrum masters, the who have a prescribed method, it's then the facilitation makes the difference in terms of mindset and how they deliver it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's sort of the expertise of the of the domain that's more required in such case. Uh, yeah. And I wouldn't say that you need to know less about the dyna dynamics, but I think, unfortunately, in practice, it, it often happens that, you know, there might be trainers and, and people that, that do training because just they know most about the method, uh, but know nothing about facilitation. And then we get a uh, university style lecture with slides and yeah. no, no empathy and no understanding for different types of learning. Totally. And I think this even happens in, um, in design thinking, for instance. Mm -hmm. where everyone believes, oh, I have the prescribed method. I just need to go through it and then it, totally forget that there's actually yeah. more than that. There's more yeah. than the activities. What I would uh, just give uh, to, to designers, or at least if design thinking is done, done by somebody who went through design education, I think compared to classical uh, engineering, at least, uh, which is often what Scrum Masters end up, uh, or uh, who, who end up being Scrum, scrum Masters are, are some type of engineers. Um, at, at design, you at least learn um, learn more about empathy and about understanding the, the needs. That's uh, true. Well, as engineers, we, at least when I went to school, we were not at all thought about that. As long as the machine works and is running, it's all yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> the designers will take care of the rest. Exactly. Yeah, interesting. What was the biggest surprise for you from the... In the report? The report? Yeah. Um, this is a very personal one, and I guess... Um, if I might have given a thought to it or, or maybe even just looked at uh, our uh, user base, maybe I would have uh, seen this, but it was that uh, there was uh, such a representation of women, uh, mm. like 62%, I think, uh, were women, um, which is, we, we have been given several interpretations of this, um, but for me, that was the, the biggest surprise. So what are the different uh, interpretations? I'm curious. Um, well, I, I am slightly worried on not uh, not being the right person to talk about this. <laughs> but um, there was this one that um, I think uh, caused some as well uh, interesting conversations uh, as, uh, after the report was published. Um, but that facilitation is from the um, 
social perspective understood as as a woman's profession because it has more of this role of um uh like tending to to the group's needs and support of the group caring um, nurturing yeah exactly hosting. <laughs> exactly um so th so that's that's one of the uh one of the uh, interpretations um but i wonder to what extent uh this will be true if or when i hope when we expand beyond our current geographic reach so mm -hmm. when we when we reach into asia more and when we reach into africa more and when we reach into more into a non english speaking um uh, regions will this change and in what direction mm, interesting and it's it's fascinating because for instance when i look at the podcast mm -hmm. i think that i have at least 50 50 if not more male guests on the podcast who self-identify as facilitators in the community i think there are more female community members and in the sessions in the workshops there are definitely more women showing up than men as participants or as participants mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. i wonder whether it is just a um a matter of visibility that there might actually be as many male facilitators as females, especially in the in the scrum and lean and design thinking world, but that the female facilitators are maybe more outspoken, more visible on social media, more active in communities, and taking the time more to fill in a twenty minute survey. Maybe, yeah, that's be. a that's a good guess. Um, I think. Yeah, I don't have a, a better answer there. Or um, I think w what I would be most curious is to see how this trend develops. Um, and maybe that's that's something that we could uh, explore through um, all the other communities that exist. Yeah. So yours, you already mentioned how it is, and and I don't know the numbers for our community, but. Uh, we could check there and, and then all other facilitation communities and see if this is confirmed, if the patterns are uh, the same, and then open the conversation. I think there were already some conversations and workshops happening on this. So I would be very curious to to understand that a bit more. Yeah. And what I think is the beauty of the report, and you mentioned it in the beginning, that it's not the answer to all the questions and it's not necessarily reflecting reality but it's a beautiful conversation trigger an opportunity to actually talk about all these things yes. of why don't we have why don't we work with co-facilitators what's holding us back why do we see more women doing the work and one aspect was also money and I think that's, um, I'm always interested in the money, money part <laughs> of facilitation, because I think we don't talk about it enough. What did you find out about um, rates of facilitation? Who charges most? Do, do men charge more than women? Maybe uh, That's, that's and, an interesting. And how much I, do we actually charge? Yeah, I, I did spend some time um, digging into that data and trying to break it down in, in various ways. So if we just... Um, look at the basic uh, distribution then we don't really um, see any differences um, but at the same time you know statistically speaking more women have uh, have given input than, than men so um, I think there is uh, some um, right. challenge challenge in that uh, the data as well um, but then um, so first, we only had one question. Uh, so I think it's very hard to to draw any significant conclusion uh, on this topic, because um, I mean, you you yourself had uh, a survey on on pricing and um, 
uh, had many more questions and, and we looked at that when we were trying to figure out what to do in our survey uh, and concluded that we need we would need to to get a better answer we would need to at least ask as many questions as you did probably even more um so uh i think here the point is just about some general feeling uh, of of where things are um and when we um when we break down uh the gender on the roles uh so uh as i previously said designer uh consultant coach trainer all the roles we had in in our survey then with almost each category we do see men uh being favored in in uh, salary and that's even to 20 percent um favored over women now again a disclaimer here um you know studies have shown that men uh, tend to uh over represent uh, a lot of things um so they might have rounded up while women might run down the number so that might adjust for some of the things mm. um but i think overall it's very hard to bring the the price of facilitation to one number because it needs to take into account so many factors. Uh, and even with our prompt in the question of uh, this type of uh, facil- uh, this type of uh, workshop for these hours, for these many people, it was still like, okay, but um, it depends on the sector, it depends on the uh, challenge, it depends on the group, it depends on, on so many other uh, questions that we couldn't, uh, couldn't specify. So uh, yeah. It's a very, very hard question uh, to Mm -hmm. answer. Um, I feel an itch when I hear that um, men are compensated up to 20% more than women, because I think there's also something about the ask. I think that men tend to ask for more with more confidence. Yeah, dare to ask for more. Yeah, And who doesn't ask doesn't get. Exactly. Exactly. So um, maybe if women would ask for higher rates, they would, would also get higher rates. Yeah. So I wouldn't um, say that it's a totally passive thing. But what are the numbers that you found for those who haven't read the report yet? So you asked for the compensation of an eight hours on-site workshop. Um, yeah. So it was. Uh, I can. I can read it. Uh, so. Uh, in-person, one-day, eight-hour workshop with 15 participants. Um, and assuming that the price includes uh, preparation and follow-up. Mm-hmm. Um, and the overall um, average was... Uh, let me just... Uh, I don't think we even wrote the overall average because it's so uh, diverse. Uh, but um north america for instance has the average of or median of uh, 3500 dollars mm-hmm. while western europe uh, and australia and new zealand have a median of 2500 so this is already one very interesting difference for me um, interesting yeah both yeah. of those areas would be called western world uh, yet there is still so so much so huge difference between value perceived value of facilitation um, and I would be, I would be careful with, with that because um, in the in the pricing survey that I run, what is it, two years ago now, mm-hmm. um, we had similar results. So the US was about a thousand euros or dollars more um, per workshop. And what we tend to forget is that if you're a freelancer in the US, you have or even if you're not a freelancer, <laughs> you have ways less social security. And mm-hmm. so everything in order to protect your job and to pay for all your living are much higher. Yeah. So um, usually the the costs or the, the rates are much higher in the US just because you have to compensate for more. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a very good point. And, and I think uh, uh, it's often easily forgotten. 
I've I've yeah. seen these conversations in other uh, other industries as well. Um, while at the same time, uh, what becomes interesting is um, with online facilitation and and everything. Um, what we've seen, for instance, when when hiring, especially when hiring in certain sectors like developers. Um, this argument tends to not work so much anymore because now, you know, uh, somebody from um, third world countries or, or uh, not not most developed countries um, who used to be a cheaper outsourced cheaper. Um, mm-hmm. uh, source uh, labor uh, suddenly realized ah, I can work anywhere and I can. I can do the uh, same amount, same same quality of work as, as the other guy. So why should I charge less yes. if I can? Yeah, so true. And then, yeah, it might be interesting for next time to ask the same question for online. Mm-hmm. Because I would also think that in the US, or maybe it depends where are people actually situated, located, if they um, host off-site um workshops are these in the bigger cities and then the costs of living are higher yeah. and then it's very difficult to compare exactly yeah i and, i um, don't know to what extent we uh, would want to focus on that because uh, yeah. we could have ask 20 more questions and then get sure. much much better data um but i think we sort of have all these other things that we also want to ask yeah. So I would actually encourage you to repeat your survey. Uh, I was just thinking, why? Maybe I I can just relaunch it. Yeah. Because yeah. another thing is, and that's also just a thought, that in the US you have more facilitators who actually facilitate for corporates, and where in um, whereas in Europe and especially in Australia, many facilitators are in the social sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's confirm that in the report itself. Uh, let me just find the sector question. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, yes. So in the report itself, we don't have a breakdown by country. Um, and I would need to look into the original source. So I cannot do that <laughs> instantly yeah. so um yeah uh, but I, I i will get back to you on that afterwards yeah maybe you can put it in the show notes if yeah. you find if you find yeah. the answer if, you, if you're curious about that listeners yeah. please uh, check the show notes i will definitely check it in the source data awesome before we speak about um the community um I always ask the same question. I would be curious to hear it from you. What makes a workshop fail? Oh, so many things. <laughs> Where to start? Um, I think one thing I was I was uh, taught as in in one of the leadership uh, trainings I, I went to was that, uh, and and I really took it to heart that you as a leader, um, whatever you are leading no matter who makes a mistake it ultimately is also your fault so you should always take a part of responsibility in in whatever happens that's under your uh let's say leadership um and i think i would say a workshop fails uh probably because of facilitator um but I don't think that's something um, anybody should take as a like really a fault. Just more as a as a reason to persist in learning and and trying and educating, because there are so many challenges. Mm. So I would maybe rephrase that questions: Where do facilitators fail? that results in, in workshops uh, failing. Mm-hmm. And and I would say um, one thing is, is preparation, obviously. Uh, so um, the rule of thumb I've been thought of is four times 
at least four times the the time you're going to spend with participants at least four times needs to four times more needs to be spent on preparation and i think to some extent that's a stupid rule of thumb because it really depends on on complexity of the of the workshop and experience and experience yeah um but uh i think to some extent there is um there is some minimum of work you definitely need to do you should never be too confident that ah oh, you've done it hundreds of times i can just do it without any any preparation sure you can and you might be lucky but uh, if you want to remove the luck factor from there uh, then i think some preparation um is is always needed um and then i think uh, the second is is lacking the buy in so if the if, if the workshop doesn't come um is not honestly um needed or honestly wanted by the client or participants mm. sometimes clients think okay I, i'm just going to send them to a workshop or a training on this and then everything will be fine um so i think again here in the facilitator has two options one is to during the the preparation and during the understanding of the needs of the client uh trying to ensure that okay uh what is the actual problem um if possible i i would always encourage that i know it's super hard but if possible talk not only to the to the clients that are requesting the workshop but also to to those who are going to be part of the workshop uh, and understand their perspective and if possible come back to the client and say okay this is what you're saying this is what i heard <laughs> um yeah. how i propose this approach um i i once facilitated the um open space uh, setup in a in an organization where um they were really really not used to any any kind of such work uh, it was a very old fashioned uh organization with hierarchies and uh what not and um the open space worked so well uh there were so many ideas that came out to solve the problem that was that was given and people felt so engaged um i think you know they were they came in there hating the, their job but knowing that's that's the only thing they have at the moment and i think at the at the peak of the workshop they were very excited and thought like okay maybe this can become a job i love um and then the boss came late missed the whole introduction came there and was like why are we discussing these things these are not problems these are not issues we should discuss this and this and this and the whole thing fell apart and uh, I was not experienced enough to to properly get out of that so in the end uh i i felt i i didn't do my job there um but i guess i should have made sure that that the boss uh, understands how this is going to work and uh yeah accepts that whatever comes out of it is what probably needs to be dealt with uh yeah. because it came from everybody not only from top um yeah. yeah so that would be the um buy-in from the client and the participants to to the process and to the um acceptance of the outcomes as well yeah. so not yeah. only the process yeah um, what else experience. can we have yeah um i think then there are uh, many things that can happen within the process itself uh dealing with with conflicts dealing with tough situations with participants um technical issues yeah. uh, especially in in the new uh post covid world yeah did you ask for um challenges for facilitation challenges in the mm -hmm. report yes yes we did yes. we did um let's look let's take a look at that so uh challenges we had two uh, two questions one was uh, where we identified uh challenges we felt uh are 
uh, common, and then the other um, where we gave open question to see if if when there is anything we missed and uh, anything emerging above. Um, and from the uh, challenges that we gave, uh, keep keeping up to date with the trends is mm -hmm. um, is number one. And I think um, that goes in line with the lonely facilitator and with the lack of engagement in communities. I think yeah. that's, I was the, just thinking that's the, the whole, same. whole connection of the main, uh, main outcome. And so I think, um, though, uh, though I also have to admit that um, just joining a community is not enough. Uh, I am in so <laughs> many communities and I just get this notification and emails uh, that I, I I don't have time to read. So I think uh, active par participation, um, yeah. and that all comes to to uh, you know how do you facilitate your life and your career as well. Mm -hmm. So as in facilitation of a workshop, that uh, the same way in facilitation of of your career, you need to sort of set goals. What are the goals uh, you want to achieve? Maybe this year, and then. You know how do you achieve them? If if it's being better and keeping up with the trends and and growing as a facilitator, joining a community is is one of the answers. But then don't don't join twenty communities and be overwhelmed and not participate in any. But choose one, commit to it to to some extent of time and and be active. And you know uh, don't run immediately to Chat GPT when you have a question, but maybe run to the community because uh, uh, you'll get less generic answer. <laughs> there and hopefully Thank more you. more humane yeah. one and um and then join in the workshops and join in, in in these things to to see um especially if if this is your profession then i mean that, that's part of that should be included in the pricing the, the cost of you spending that time to learn and to get better yes yeah good one yeah thank you that's such a good one and i think Participating in workshops in communities helps us to just rebuild empathy to our participants because sometimes we forget how it is to be thrown out of our comfort zone and to give be given some instructions that are not clear, finding ourselves in a breakout room asking, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or a mirror board or <laughs> a new tech that we don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the second challenge uh, in the list, uh, or the second most voted for, let's say, uh, was getting the buy-in from stakeholders. So that's that's exactly mm -hmm. the the point I mentioned earlier. Um, and then it's moving uh, moving to hybrid, dealing with conflicts, um, finding clients, and so on. Um, and and similarly, or not similar, but in the other challenges, uh, people mentioned uh, getting the job. Um, so this was open open and the answers and we try to uh, categorize and label them somehow uh, so we the first category we identified as the biggest even though it, it's not huge it's only 17 percent was was this kind of getting the job adequate pay visibility so that was more of this recognition mm -hmm. uh, recognition both of the needs of facilitation and the value that facilitation uh, uh, yeah. brings to organizations Interesting. Yeah. And how is it in, in your community? So what is um what do you observe? Because I I love what you just said that it's not enough to just sign up for a community. <laughs> and it reminds me very often of the books that I order. Mm -hmm. Just ordering the book is not enough. I yes. still need to read it and then I need to apply it. Right? Yeah. Um, and with community, it's the same. And um, I advertise very clearly, okay, this is not a done for you community. You have, the more you put in, the more you get out. Um, and I would assume that in my community, people are more active just because it's a paid one. Mm -hmm. How is it, what do you observe in your community? What are the trends and do they match actually the outcomes of the report? Um. Hmm. What outcomes of the report would I link them to? I'm I'm not sure about the last part of the question. Uh, I think overall, uh, when we talk about the report and and discussion that we had around it in the community, I think 
overall it matched uh, people were not really challenging too much uh the outcomes but i guess also to to great extent those people were part of the survey as well so i am not surprising there as for um the rest i think uh, the the engagement is um not as high as we would want to be want it to be um i think we have uh very interesting events and i think that's uh what um at the moment gives the most value to participants um so we have uh in a way double down on that and 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 want to do even more of these things um but doing uh, having conversations outside of that still seems um a bit slow um especially compared to how many people are in the community and how many people join the events and then usually posts in the community itself don't get uh, much reaction mm. um i think i think there are various um challenges there um it's some might be just habits on 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 this some might be um the fact that these communities now most of these communities that have emerged in the past few years are not on facebook they're not on linkedin they're on these new platforms and and it's a bit habitual barrier to get into the new space and and do something um it will be much easier if this comes into your feed in Facebook and then you just need to need to answer uh, there. But I'm also part of some Facebook communities uh, where I see uh, a lot of questions, but not too many responses as well. So it's mm-hmm. not it's not always true, uh, only that. Um, so I think there is, um, and, and that's why I would double down on the on, on what I said before. Don't try to be in every every single community and uh hope uh, to to uh, get as much value from it uh but rather uh commit to one or two um because i think all of our communities have slightly different perspectives so i'm not saying there is one better than the other one um but rather uh maybe observe and then once you get the sense of which one uh fits you better try to give back um yeah. but i think uh at the same time, I think that this is not something that's going to drastically change. Um, I think we see we see this in um, all the communities of practice that have existed much longer than than ours. Uh, that in general, you will have a few uh, very active uh, people of the community and many um, many who are just observing um yeah i think that's yeah we can we can just try to do our best and then there there are other ways like yours to to have it private uh or not private but but paid uh for yeah. which both brings more serious engagement um and and i guess increases the quality uh of that engagement and uh it can be made into a uh maybe not paid but privileged club and where only certain kind of people that have connection with other people or whatever setup gamified setup can be uh, done um, and you know maybe for some cases that that could work but um, we we wanted to make it open uh, yeah. for us that that's in line with our open library of content and in general uh, from day one our uh, openness was was strong part of uh what we wanted to do in session lab because we believed in this open sharing of knowledge uh making the whole industry better yeah and i think you are making a huge contribution to that through the library but also through the product that is actually that one can use for free um i think the free version covers a lot of things yeah we the way we we think about this we are a business so obviously we we do need to uh, somehow sustain uh, both the tool and all the resources that go into creating the content we we provide um so if 
if we give you enough value as a professional, then you would hopefully get into the uh, process where where you would pay, but that would not, you know, be a significant dent in in your budget. Uh, while if you are uh, doing this as occasional uh, side project or side gig, then um, you should be satisfied with with the free version of uh, yeah. Session Lab for for a while at least. And um, and I think in that case, you will probably even get even more value from uh, the content that's also fully open, because if you're not doing this regularly, you might need refreshment or ideas on on what to do in your workshops. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then it makes sense that the community is free and open. Um, and I think there is also a difference in communities that are related to a product then it's a community of practice they can also learn how to use the tool together yeah, yeah. And how to contribute exactly exactly and we we do have an aspect of that uh obviously um since it is a session lab community we didn't try to brand it differently or anything like that um but we are not putting main focus on that there is area within the community where you can discuss product and we occasionally have events where where uh it's related to the product topic but we are trying to give uh, the value to those people that uh, are, are not necessarily our users, or even if they are our users, it's not, you know, there there is many more things about facilitation than, than using a tool. Yes, so. <laughs> yes. Or um, even doing the activities, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you as well, and especially thank you for the um, all the help with the report. I mean, you you've uh, provided feedback early on 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 when we formed the questions, and you're one of the expert insights uh, or experts that gave insights. So uh, it was really nice collaborating with you on that. Yes, and currently we are collaborating on a contest. Yes, for, uh, workshop agendas, workshop designs to further educate yeah. the world on what it makes. Actually, I don't know when this episode will go out. Will the contest already be finished by then? Um, most if not, probably. if not, the deadline is April 19, twenty twenty three, mm -hmm. and hopefully, it won't be the last one. <laughs> no. no, so keep the eyes open. Yeah. Wonderful. Was there anything that you would have liked to mention that we haven't touched upon yet? Hmm. I haven't asked you for your number one challenge. As in number one challenge when I'm facilitating. Yeah. If you um, do if you still facilitate. So that's that's a Good question. I definitely don't facilitate the same way I did before. Um, and here I don't mean in terms of I grew so much or, or any of those things, but rather than um, as, as I now have business this family. business to run, uh, it's uh, I facilitate mostly internally within uh, our company. So that's that's uh, from Christmas parties to uh, to design sprints and various uh, such uh, such things. Um, uh, so definitely, definitely the, the aspect of, you know, knowing your clients uh, or participants uh, is is completely different now, um, as well as uh, I was actually reflecting on this today, how as an um, internal facilitator uh, in this context, I actually very rarely get the chance to be only a facilitator. Uh, and I think that's that's not ideal uh, it, uh, i think it would be better if i was not wearing also the uh, uh, owner or or any other hat that i might be wearing at, at that moment um because it does sometimes distract me from uh focus um uh, not too much i hope uh but it, it i know that 
sometimes I know the most about certain topic that we talk about because mm. maybe it's very technical or maybe I've done it in the past and so on. So I need to jump in and, and contribute uh, instead of just guiding the conversation. So then at the same time, I need to talk, but also facilitate myself. <laughs> that mm. I don't talk too much or that I don't influence too much or that I give space. So uh, that's that's yeah. one of the challenges. And um, we, whenever we can, we actually love to work with other facilitators when we have our retreats and we have when we have our uh, even online we've done uh, several um, workshops when we f- had the need of something uh, sometimes it, it's obviously because we are not experts on the topic but sometimes it's it's just because it's so much easier and better and and uh, to have somebody external to just guide us and we all both uh, my co-founder and, and I can feel full engagement yeah and and participate and be don't have to be neutral yeah yeah exactly so um i think i had two points but i now lost what was the other point i wanted to make uh yeah and also i think i lost what was the question <laughs> that started this ah the challenge uh so what is the biggest challenge i have now so i think because of because of that change um probably it's it's the that is one of the challenges uh, of, of wearing too many hats um and not being able to fully uh, only uh, facilitate is that the biggest one though i'm not i'm not sure that's the biggest challenge i think uh, the biggest challenge might be the the number one thing i uh, i said as as leading to failure um and that's uh i never feel like i've put enough time in the preparation mm. i i never feel i have enough time to put in the preparation so i think um i always um <laughs> i tend to uh prepare to some extent and then prepare a lot just before the workshop uh sometimes meaning not sleeping much <laughs> the night before um which if it's only one day workshop actually energizes me a lot <laughs> but then i crash the day after um and uh, i think uh even with that you know last burst of of preparation uh and and trying to add more um despite lack of time i'm never fully satisfied but i don't know if if i ever would be i think that's that's <laughs> part of the you know, uh, everlasting desire to to grow and be better and do more. So I don't think it has yet led to led to workshops I would call a failure, um, but I think they have not reached their full potential, let's say. Mm. Thank you. I think that um, many can relate to that, <laughs> included. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's also a trade-off because especially for a workshop with all the dynamics, you can never be prepared for what's happening. Yeah. Because you don't know you don't control it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I, I envy you and and all the uh, friends and, and colleagues I have that facilitate more often because that gives you a bit of edge and ad- advantage uh, yeah. in the terms of, of you know, uh, even if you spend the same amount of time preparing uh, as maybe I do, you at least uh, have this, like you're warmed up, your engine is already running. Um, well, I always need to, to boot it up first. Yeah, that's true. And especially with the community and never done before, I think I can just... I can come up with a workshop design in an hour and just run it and see what happens. Yeah, that's Um, awesome. awesome. It's like a muscle that I've been training. Yeah, Yeah. quite intensively. I'm 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 looking forward to the moment when uh, I can uh, step away from certain roles within the company and maybe get back into the facilitation world a bit more, Um, or let's say, in the practice of the facilitation a bit more, because yeah. I'm definitely very much in that world at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is fun. 
Beautiful. What do you, last question, very last, what would you consider the future of facilitation? Hmm. Future of facilitation. I think I, uh, I think future of facilitation is a combination of tools or, or new, new or improved tools. Uh, and here I'm thinking, you know, digital tools, not, not methods uh, themselves, but, uh, digital and maybe non-digital tools, um, that are there to maybe be one of the co-facilitators, but are less, less intrusive in a way. Um, I think uh, technology has really uh, had a major uh, advancement over the last decades. I mean, all the time, uh, <laughs> just months now, if we talk about the AI, uh, huge change. Um, and yet I think a lot of it is still, you need to think about it. Mm. You need to think about setting up this Zoom meeting and you need to think about microphone being on and camera being well-placed. And you need to think about the, you know, in, in live presence, you need to think about if you're projecting something or if you're uh, recording in any way, or th there are a lot of things um, that technology is um doing well but requires you to keep it uh, at the top or or close to the top of your mind um so i think the future is equal or more help in terms of what technology brings uh but without this overhead of of thinking um mm -hmm. of thinking about it so it's it's seamless it it is really there to help and not not hinder the process in any way yeah um so this is more uh technocratic look at at uh, the future um i think in the in the other uh way or the other perspective is um i think facilitation already is almost everywhere or it's very very present um, as Douglas wrote in the in the report, facilitation facilitation is everywhere. Um, but I think it's not getting the recognition uh, it needs. Um, and I think we talked about people doing facilitation but not being aware, or people actually having facilitation role but not facilitating or not facilitating properly. Uh, question is, can you not facilitate, or is is even bad facilitation facilitation? Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, depending on where, where you look at that, um, I think changing in this perception is, is hopefully future. I don't know how close though, uh, mm. I think a lot of things need to happen there. Education needs to, uh, step up. I think, um, we are see seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of emerging of, of uh, facilitation courses, uh, often connected to various communities uh, or or agencies, and I think that's good. Um, I wonder what is the future of education in general, uh, being a, you know somebody with uh, academic background, uh, but also stepping out of academia. One of the reasons was because I found a lot of things there not working well mm -hmm. and uh yet universities are here uh, and and people still go there um so uh, can they catch up can we have more formal uh education here do we need it that's also a question does it need to be formalized or mm. is, is that um gonna be should should it be part of every education uh okay. that that facilitation is something you need to learn about um interesting yeah. questions yeah more questions than answers yes 
and that's yeah. the future <laughs> yeah and i um i can relate to that especially also with the first part to have more technology that helps us to actually if we had space to be more creative and more present in the moment mm -hmm. yeah and then yeah education hopefully facilitation will be part of i hope part of an mba program part of business education managers education mm. teachers education yeah. yeah hopefully to be fair i think i think aspects of facilitation already are mm. uh, i've not done mba myself but i i would think that a lot of what we talk about group dynamics and and so on must be part of some leadership at least good leadership training um so i wonder what do we need here do we need to label those things as facilitation skills uh so that the area the 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 indus industry the, the practice of facilitation gets more value um and 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 you know does it need to be a facilitation mm -hmm. course within mba um or or is it just about recognizing that um all of these techniques fall under this one umbrella um Good. and if you're practicing that in any way this is what you should be looking for good point um yeah yeah good food for thought yes thank you philip thank you as well it was a pleasure to speak with you and i will put all the links in the show notes yeah and i still need to answer that question about sector and uh, distribution per country yes or at least continue. remember awesome yeah. <laughs> so yes. talk to you soon yeah thank you have a great day and weekend ahead you too